I wanted to take a little bit of time in between songs to mention something uh, specifically for you watching online. If you don't know, we still meet in person. We still play music. We still have childcare and coffee and donuts. And all of those things are available to you as a form of community, and we would love it if you would come and hang out with us every once in a while. If you don't know when to hang out with us, you can go to stonebrook.tv slash events. That calendar has all of the events basically for the entire year of 2023. Um, also, if you see someone or if you're next to someone that doesn't know that we still meet, let them know and invite them to the next one. But I really want to mention it. I've heard over and over and over again, Stonebrook's not meeting anymore. Stonebrook never gets together. We do. This is me shouting out to you, stonebrook.tv slash events. Get your butt here. When you begin to talk about God and you have discussions about it, which is an extremely good thing to do. It's what for thousands and thousands of years, especially Jewish people, would get, gather together. They would have a meal and maybe even have a gathering like this. And then they would discuss their various viewpoints and their experiences with this person that they came to know as uh, Yahweh was the name of their God. It wasn't always the name of their God. That's an interesting discussion that we will probably get into. How you can sort of tell when something in the Bible was written by what, or uh, the name that they referred to God by. Originally Elohim and some other names. But uh, in general, they came to know as, God, uh, as Yahweh, and they discussed who he is and their experiences. And what people don't know about the Bible many times is there are varying viewpoints, and that's okay. In fact, that's very good. Because our desire, as has been the desire of humans for years, is to understand who God is. We can see some things that he does, we believe. We can have experiences that we think are, are God. But we can't just walk up to him and shake him by the hand and say, could you sit down? Can we have coffee sometime, God? I'd like to get to know you more. So we do it by having these discussions and interactions and it seems that when you're having a discussion about God, this book, it's not really a book, we've talked about that, it's a collection of ancient documents. This book seems to be the centerpiece, the foundation, if you will, the thing that everything circles back to, well, the Bible says, okay? And if you've studied the Bible for any period of time at all, or if you're aware of how Christians are, there's 45,000 different denominations who disagree on some or all points concerning who God is, how he acts, what he does, and what this book means. So to really have any uh, discussion of depth and any intelligent discussion, we need to maybe stop and ask, what is this? Because it's used in different ways. And I believe that it's used in a way mostly that's different from what this, I'm going to call it a book, understand it's not a book, than what this book itself teaches us to use it, okay? So that, that's what we're talking about. What is, what is the Bible? And so if you have questions as we go along, if you're here uh, in the audience, you can stop anytime and um, answer questions. And I always wanna reiterate this, you're free at any time to go. It's not gonna make me mad, I'm not gonna think you're upset unless you slam stuff down and I may assume well, they don't love Jesus anymore, something like that. But you're welcome, you know, if it gets a little bit too long, we're going to talk about 45 minutes and then have time for questions. You're welcome to leave at any time, and you're welcome to ask questions at any time. Because what I will talk about normally, and especially for the next few weeks, will raise more questions than answers. You will not leave here today smarter than you came, <laughs> okay? You will leave here... Uh, th th this is my total goal, goal, especially today, is for at the end of our... our time together for you to go, hmm, and that's it. That's all we're after today. Now, I've said uh, in the past few times that it would be really, really great, especially if you're watching online, to go back and look at the others that we've talked about because we can't keep repeating, but every misunderstanding that I've ever heard, whether from an atheist or a skeptic, or a believer concerning the existence or the nature of God, every Misunderstanding can be traced back to a fundamental flaw in answering this one question. And that's the question we're trying to deal with is, what is the Bible? 
Now, there was a, a passage that we read last week that's very famous, especially when you start discussing some of the things that we're saying here. Christians will say all Scripture is inspired. The word inspired simply means breathed by God. And is, please say this next word, with feeling. See, why does feeling mean louder? I don't know, but it feels like it's more, you really mean it now. It's useful. The first step to me, or the first answer with what is the Bible is, it's useful to teach us what is true, to make us realize what's wrong, et cetera, et cetera. Then it also says God, God uses it. So there's this question of use, and that's why, that's why we're talking about this, because people use this for certain things. And we want to know, and there's, there's actually two questions, and I didn't come up with these questions. I've always had these questions, but a guy named Peter Inns that I love to read uh, after him, he asks these questions all the time. What is the Bible, number one? And number two, what do we do with it? Or in other words, how do we use it? And the questions that we're looking at, uh, when it comes to the Bible, because there's a phrase that people say, people say all the time in you know, doing some rebuttal or saying what they believe about God, they will say, the Bible clearly says. Anyone ever heard someone say the Bible clearly says? All the time, all the time. How many of you, and I'm going to raise my hand, have ever said to someone, the Bible clearly says, you said that. Okay, I've said it. And it, of course, it does clearly say what I believe it says, so I just say the Bible clearly says. But then when someone else says it, well, that's not clear at all. But it's obviously that the Bible doesn't clearly say anything, or there wouldn't be 45,000 denominations arguing about what the Bible says. If it was clear, there wouldn't be all these discussions. But the question is, does it need to be analyzed? Or is it just, no, you just read it, there's no use analyzing it. Does it need to be interpreted? This is, can be a sticking point with people. Well, that's just your interpretation. So how do we interpret it? Is the only allowable way to understand Scripture, literal, if it says it, that's what it means. Historical, if it talks about an event that actually happened, and scientific, if it mentions something about the reality of the world we live in, is that the way it is? Does it do we have to pick between science or the Bible? Now, many of you, how many of you ever, let me do this, and I just want to get a little feedback, have ever um, had a T-shirt or a coffee mug? Christians love to read the Bible while drinking coffee, so they put it on their cups. Or a coffee mug or something maybe on, when I was younger, people put scriptures on their mirrors. How many of you have ever had an inspirational Scripture that gave you inspiration, uh, excitement, helped you get through the week? Any of those? Cool. So I, I want to talk a little bit about, because how do we use it? And here are some that you may be familiar with. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They'll soar high on wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. Do you know that passage? Okay. It's from Isaiah. So that's a nice one. Here's another one. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged. I'm your God. I'll strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. Isn't that a good passage? And I'm, not, <clears throat> I'm honestly not making fun of this because there's been times where, okay, let me go to read Isaiah 41 because I'm about to die. And so you read that passage and it lifts you up and helps you through whatever you're going through. Uh, here's a good one that people use. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Isn't that good news? Isn't that great? And you've been in a, you've been in a church where they read that, and the preacher gets wound up, and he says, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter what you believe God has told you to do, and it's not happening. happening. Be courageous. He is with you. And that, even some of you right now are going, yes, finally, we're getting some good preaching. Okay, but here, here is like the ultimate one. And I'm just using the Old Testament because we're talking about the Old Testament. Because there is, the ultimate one is probably Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's the big one. But here is like at either right there with it or number two. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. 
Plans for good and not for disaster to give you a future and a hope. And so those are encouraging. Those are scriptures. Is that how the Bible is to be used? So in discussing this, this is what I want to see. Is that the principle that we go anywhere in the Bible and find a scripture, and that is God's message to us? Is that how the Bible works? Because it seems to me like that most people use that, most preachers use that, most Christians go to church where preachers use things like that to give inspiration and encouragement to get you through your week or get you through whatever you're going. Is that how it works? Because, like here's Jeremiah 29, 11, and that's very encouraging. But just a few verses before, here's Jeremiah 28, 16. Therefore, this is what the Lord says, you must die. Your life will end this very year because you've rebelled against the Lord. Now, what I want to know is how do we determine, determine what is the criteria of choosing this one is God speaking to me and this one, well, that was Jeremiah speaking to someone else and you know what was happening at the time? Yes, I do know what was happening at the time. The question is, do you know what was happening at the time? And are we using the Bible correctly? Now, I don't want to ruin your coffee mug or your T-shirt or the fact that this verse gets you through the week. Don't stop those things. I'm not speaking against it. I'm just asking the question, what is the Bible? Now, if you don't know what's happening in this time where Jeremiah says, I know the plans I have for you, I want to tell you what it is. Jeremiah wrote a letter. Now, I'm, I'm going to share the letter in a minute, but you need to know that there is a prophet named Hananiah. And the people of Judah have been mostly, most of them have been taken away to Babylon. They've been captured by the Babylonian army, King Nebuchadnezzar. They've been taken away and they're in exile away. Some, some of the Judahites are still there. And so there's a prophet named Hananiah who prophesies, don't worry about all this. I know Jerusalem has been destroyed. I know most of the people have been taken away. But in two years, here's what God says. I have broken the yoke off of your captivity. I have broken the back of Nebuchadnezzar and his armies. And the king, Jeconiah, will be returned as well as all the people in Babylon will return within two years. And everybody went, yay! Because it reminds me of most churches today in the Western Hemisphere. They say things so people will go, yay! I know the plans I have for you. Yay! Well, there's a prophet, not Jeremiah, saying two years, this is all going to be over. It's just going to be a bad dream. Just a little speed bump in our history. It's all going to be restored. Yes! And that's what prompts Jeremiah to say, no, and frankly, Hananiah, you're going to be dead this year. Thanks. And he moves on, and he writes a letter from Jerusalem to the elders, priests, prophets, and all the people who have been exiled to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. This happened in 586 BCE. That's really important. In fact, if you're going to understand the Old Testament, this is everything. 586 BC, the people of Judah, who are the only tribe them and a little bit of Benjamin. We're going to find out today why Benjamin was so small. They've been, they're the only ones left because the rest of them have been dispersed throughout the kingdom of Assyria, who was eventually taken over by Babylon. But this is what the Lord of Heaven's army says uh, to all the captives he has exiled from Jerusalem. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produced. Marry, have children, then find spouses for them so that you may have many grandchildren. Multiply, do not dwindle away, and work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. You're in Babylon, and you hate the Babylonians, and you hate this foreign city because you're not in your land, but I want you to work for the prosperity of your captors. I want you to put them first and make things good for them, pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. 
This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. Do not let your prophets and fortune tellers who are with you in the land of Babylon trick you. Don't listen to their dreams because they are telling you lies in my name. I have not sent them. This is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years, but then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised and will bring you home again. For I know the plans I have for you. There are plans for good, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. 70 years from now, but have a good time. You're going to be a captive for a while. So if we're going to use the scripture correctly and try to apply it for us, it could be that I'm going through a really good time. Well, God says, get comfortable. You're going to be there for a long time. Well, that doesn't sound very inspiring, does it? But we take this one verse because it sounds good and apply it in a way that the Bible doesn't intend. And we make the Bible simply a blessing box, which actually came out when I was a child, a blessing box. Daily, when you were brushing your teeth, shaving your face, you open the blessing box and pull it out of Scripture. That was always something good that God was saying for you. And you were blessed by it. And so we turn the Bible into this thing where we simply open it up and find a verse that we like and apply it to our life. And we miss so much more of who God is. And we basically impugn the character and the reason this collection of things was put together. So just wanted to point that out because I'm going to read some other passages and I want to see if we use them the same way. What we're going to talk about today is one of the most horrific and awful and disgusting stories in the Old Testament. Are you excited? Are you glad? It's really bad. And you probably have never heard them. It wasn't in your Sunday school class. I'm pretty sure you shouldn't read these to your children. Well, it's the Bible. I don't care. Don't read it. So you should read it, though, and you should pay attention. And it's from the book of of Judges. And in telling this story, like I said, I don't have too many things to share this morning. I'm going to read lots and lots of passages, and I just want you to go, hmm, because I'm going to point out a couple things that these stories tell us that's going to get us to thinking more, what in the world is this collection? and What is going on here? Now, the book of Judges, do you guys know the chronology of the book of Judges? Do you know like where it is in history? Do you know the story? Have you read the Bible? (laughs) Uh, Have you seen the movie? We have, let's start with the people of Israel leaving Egypt, and they're coming to the promised land, Canaan, and that ends with Deuteronomy. They start to go into the land, and then in Joshua, they fight a bunch of people, kill a bunch of babies, and take over the people's property, and Judges is after that, okay? Judges is a time where they're kind of in the land of Canaan, but there's still enemies around that they have not conquered. Okay, there's an ongoing fight. They're kind of there, and some of the tribes don't really have a place to live yet, so they're trying to kill some people so they can take their houses. It's really great. You should read your Bible. But in Judges, the word judge, instead of thinking of somebody sitting in a courtroom, they did sort of kind of judge between people on issues of law. But think of deliverers. The story of Samson. Do you know who Samson was? Did Samson have big muscles? We don't know. The Bible doesn't say anything about his physique. So, um, but anyway, Samson was a judge. He was a deliverer. Samuel was the last judge. Deborah was a female judge, a female leading God's people. Horror of horrors. You have all these different people who uh, are, are judges, but think deliverers. Because judges... Is a, it's a, a, a series of cycles. This is important. Disobedience of the people of Israel, captivity. Some of the nations around them are beating their behinds. Okay? They're not able to uh, do what God supposedly told them to do, to go in the land and conquer these people. These people are conquering them. So they would go and say, God, we're sorry, we shouldn't have worshiped that tree. And God says, okay. I'll send Samson, and he will kick their butts. And so he does. And the people go, yay, God's the best. 
and then you turn the next page, and they're worshiping trees again. That's basically the story of Judges. Over and over, the cycle of disobedience, captivity, repentance, deliverance. Now, how can I say this? It's, it's important to know who's writing the Bible. Who's writing this, this collection in the Old Testament? Who, who's doing it? Like what group of people? What? Jewish people, yeah. Which there's only the writings are coming from one tribe. That's it. You're getting one tribe's perspective. Which tribe? Who? Judah. Judah. The tribe of Judah is writing the Old Testament. And we're going to tell you why we know that and why it's important. But the Old Testament wasn't written slash edited slash compiled until after 586 B.C. It started a little bit before then. During the exile into Babylon, during the exile into Babylon, there's only one tribe left, Judah. Everything that's being written in the Old Testament from Genesis all the way through is coming from the tribe of Judah. Why does that matter? Because everything they're writing about is reflecting on their experience of being in exile. Judges is, they were disobedient, they got went into captivity, they repented and God delivered them. That's what Judah needs right now because they've been disobedient, they've went into captivity, they're trying to repent and they want to be delivered. So they begin to write these stories which may or may not have happened exactly historically in the way we think of historicity, the way that they're written. Now, let me point out a couple things about Judges. This will either be really cool to you or the most boring experience you've ever had in church. So let's get into it. In those days, do you mind to say those three words with me? Okay. In those days, Israel had no king. This tells us an extremely important thing about the Old Testament, but specifically about judges. What does that tell you? What? Who's looking back? But what do the writers, and what have the writers experienced that the stories they're writing about haven't? They have a king or have had kings. This that we're about to read cannot be, because in those days, Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. It's mentioned at least three times in the book of Judges. In those days, Israel had no king. Of necessity, it must be that the people that are writing this have been in a time period when Israel had kings. If we write a story and we say, in those days, people traveled exclusively by horse and buggy. Well, doesn't that identify that, well, this wasn't written in 1743? Well, it's talking about what happened in 1743, but it couldn't have been written because it said in those days, people traveled exclusively by horse and buggy. They did not have Teslas. Well, that tells me that was something that was written much, much later. The time period that Judges des uh, describes is from 1400 BC, and this is you know, approximate, 1400 B.C. to 1000 B.C., okay? That's the time period. There were no kings in Israel till after 1000 B.C.E. And for a few hundred years, there were kings in Israel. So it had to be written after at least 300 years before the first events of Judges. And then they tell another story, and I won't tell the background about this, <clears throat> then they set up the carved image, and they appointed Jonathan, son of Gershom, son of Moses, as the priest. This family continued as priest for the tribe of Dan until the exile. Well, what does that tell us about these writings? What? It had to have happened after the exile. The exile happened in 586 B.C., now, maybe they're talking about the exile of the northern kingdom, which was 722, but still, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. 
To compare, it would be like me deciding I'm going to write about my family's history starting in the 1500s, a very detailed account. And I don't have Google, and I don't have any writings. I just have some stories, and we're in captivity, and most of those have been lost, and a lot of the people who used to tell those stories are dead now. So who's writing the Old Testament? It's Judah. We talked about that. The northern kingdom went into exile. I won't talk about this, although I'd love to talk about it. The, northern, the ten northern kingdoms are gone. The fall of Jerusalem happens in 586 BCE. That's really, really, really important to remember. Now, in those days, I don't know if we mentioned this, Israel had no king. It's another verse. And we're going to tell, I'm just going to read the story. Before I start, I want to sort of sum up the story, because the, the story I want to tell this morning, actually, is the story of a man or a person, a being, that goes into this town, and he, he hangs around in the square of the town, and then he is invited to stay in this home of this man, and as soon as he gets into that house, a bunch of men surround the house and say, hey, Harvey, the guy's name was Harvey, it actually wasn't, but they say, hey, there's a stranger that we noticed came into town, and he's staying in your house. Bring him outside, because we want to have sex with him. <laughs> so he said, Whoa. finally, we're getting some excitement in this sermon. Bring him out. We want to have sex with him. And the guy comes out and says, no, 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 no. Here, I have my virgin daughter here. Here, have sex with her. But don't have sex with this person that's a guest in my house. Okay? So what is that story? You're familiar with that story. No, it's not. We're not going to talk about Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah isn't in Judges. Now, I'm saying this, and I'm setting you up for a reason, because I want you to go, hmm. Because in this story in Judges, I don't know if we mentioned, but Israel had no king. There was a man from the tribe of Levi living in a remote area of the hill country of Ephraim, which is to the north of Jerusalem. One day he brought home a woman from Bethlehem and Judah to be his concubine. Let's just ask that question as we start. So is this the Bible telling me I can have a concubine? He has a concubine. Why can't I have a concubine? Is it okay to have concubines? Is there a place you can even get concubines? Is there a store? Where is this service? I'm not familiar. But she became angry with him, maybe because he's making her a concubine. I don't know. And she returned to her father's home in Bethlehem. After about four months, her husband set out for Bethlehem to speak personally to her, persuaded her to come back. Honey, I didn't mean to come home. He took with him a servant and a pair of donkeys, which is very important when you're trying to convince your concubine to come home. You at least need two donkeys. When he arrived at her father's house, his father saw him and welcomed him. His father urged him to stay a while, so he stayed three days, eating, drinking, and sleeping there. This is Near Eastern Hospitality. No, stay. I know you made my daughter a concubine. It's okay. We'll have a big feast. On the fourth day, the man was up early, ready to leave, but the woman's father said to his son-in-law, have something to eat before you go. This man was from Alabama, I guess. It's, you ever try to leave a southern household? We really have to go. Oh, let's have dessert before you go. Stay another night. It's just, they don't mean it, but that's what happens. So the two sat down together and had something to eat and drink. Then the woman's father said, please stay another night and enjoy yourself. The man got up to leave, but his father-in-law kept urging to stay, so he finally gave in and stayed the night. Okay? So you didn't know, is this inspirational? Put this on a coffee mug. A guy can't get away from his father-in-law. He keeps asking him to go. So on the morning of the fifth day, he was up early again to leave, ready to leave. And again, the woman's father said, have something to eat. You can leave in the afternoon. The traffic's bad this time of day. So they had another day of feasting. Later, as the man and his concubine and servant were praying to leave, his father-in-law said, Look, it's almost evening. Stay the night and enjoy yourself. Tomorrow you can get up early and be on your way. The guy is on to him, but this time the man was determined to leave. So he took his two saddled donkeys and his concubine and headed in the direction of, Je of Jabus, which eventually becomes Jerusalem. Another instance where you can tell this was not written at the time it's happening because Jerusalem was called Jabus. Okay? It was late in the day when they neared Jabus, and the manservant said to him, let's stop at this Jebusite town and spend the night here. And he said, no, we can't stay in this foreign town where there are no Israelites. Instead, we will go on to Gibeah. So the guy is just like your husband when you're on a trip. No, I think we can make it to the next town. I'm sure there's a hotel there. Of course, now you can Google. 
but I've done that many times. I'm sure we can make it the next town. They don't have a hotel or a gas station. And so you're driving in the middle of the night in the Nevada desert, and you don't, not that that's ever happened. But come on, let's try to get as far as Gibeah or Ramah, and we'll spend the night in one of those towns. So they went on. The sun was setting as they came to Gibeah, a town in the land of, of Benjamin. So they stopped there to spend the night, and they rested in the town square. Rest in the town square. But no one took them in for the night. They're going to this town, not expecting to find a hotel, but somebody will surely see us, and they'll invite us to spend the night with them. It's just the way it was. That evening, an old man came from his work in the field. He was from the hill country of Ephraim. But he was living in Gibeah, where the people were from the tribe of Benjamin. Remember, Judah is telling this story, but after this period of time, the Benjamin part, the, the lower two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, just became Judah because there were so few Benjamites left. The story is explaining why to the young children that are in exile in Babylon hundreds of years later, because they're like, why is Tommy the only Benjamin kid at our school? The rest of us are from Judah. Why aren't there more people from Benjamin? Well, this is why. When he saw the traveler sitting in the square, he asked him, where are you going? And he said, we've been in Bethlehem. We're traveling here. No one has taken us in. Even though we have everything we need, we have food, for wine for our donkeys and food. No. Anyway, whiskey for my men, beer for my horses. You're welcome to stay with me, the old man said. I'll give you anything you might need, but whatever you do, don't spend the night in the square. So he took them home with him, fed the donkeys, washed their feet, and they ate and drank together. While they were enjoying themselves, a crowd of troublemakers from the town surrounded the house. They began beating at the door and shouting to the old man, bring out the man who's staying with you so we can have sex with him. Now just let me ask a question at this point. How many of you here, just be honest, there's no shame in your game, did not know this story was in the Bible? How many of you knew the story of Sodom and Gomorrah was in the Bible? How many of you would agree that this is sounding a lot like the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? Okay, but you didn't know this one. And I want to know why that is. It's in the same book. And isn't it odd that this is happening again? Isn't it odd that the same thing is happening again that happened a thousand years before? The old man stepped outside to talk to them. No, my brothers, don't do such an evil thing. If this man's a guest, what you're doing would be shameful. Absolutely, that would be awful. But this would be okay. Take my virgin daughter and this man's concubine. Now, is the Bible, how do I use the Bible? Do I go to the Bible, and do I find an ethical thing? Because people will say, you know what America needs to get back to morality? Is they need to follow this book. Cool. If I have a guest over, and he's a guy, and they want to have sex with him, I'm going to say, no, but just a minute, I'll go get my daughter. You can have her. Is that what I do? Do I follow this? I, I'm not understanding. But... I will bring them out to you, and you can abuse them and do whatever you like. Okay? But don't do such a shameful thing to this man. That would be bad. But here's my daughter and this concubine. They don't mean anything. They're our property anyway. We can sacrifice them for our safety. So that's what you do as a man, writing this down, because people say, we need to get back to biblical manhood. Sacrifice your woman for your safety. It's in the Bible. Doesn't matter if they rape her. But they wouldn't listen to him, so the Levite took hold of his concubine and pushed her out the door. The men of the town abused her all night, taking turns raping her until the morning. Finally, at dawn, they let her go. At daybreak, the woman returned to the... I'm sorry, you haven't turned it yet. <coughs> at daybreak, the woman returned to the house where her husband was staying. She collapsed at the door of the house <coughs> and lay there until it was light. When her husband opened the door to leave, there lay his concubine with her hands on the threshold. And he went, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I can't believe I did this to you. He said, get up. Let's go. Are you taking notes, Ben? This is good marriage advice. I'm telling you how to treat women from the B-I-B-L-E. Get up. Let's go. 
but there was no answer. So he put her body on his donkey and took her home. When he got home, he took a knife and cut his concubine's body into 12 pieces. Then he sent one piece to each tribe throughout the territory of Israel. Everyone who saw it says such a horrible crime has not been committed in all the time since Israel left Egypt. Think about it. What are we going to do? Who's going to speak up? So this is a horrific story, number one. But let me just point out a thing. I'm, I'm just going to drop it here, and then we're going to go somewhere else. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Which came first, Sodom and Gomorrah? And, oh my gosh, this is happening again? Or this story, which is much closer to the times of the people that are writing it, this story where there would have been records because it's right before the kings came in. By the way, just to throw this out, there is no historical corroboration of any of the events of the Bible up to about the time of the kings. I'm sorry if you read an article about they found chariot wheels at the bottom of the Red Sea. It's BS. It's not true. There's no historical corroboration. But here we have a story that is really close to the time of the kings, that is much closer to the time of people who are actually writing it about some guys that came to town and the people wanted to have sex with them and the concubine. And did that maybe come first? And the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is a retelling, is a reflection of something that happened in near history to kind of explain that this has been our pattern throughout our whole history as a nation. Just an idea. Because I, I want to take just a minute of time to, to share another story that I think you're familiar with. You remember the story where there was a leader in Israel and the people had kind of separated from the other leader. And um, so he told them, the people say, you know, we, we don't like being under this leader. Make some gods for us. So the guy said, give me all your gold. And he melted it down, and he made a golden calf. And the people worshipped that golden calf. Do you know that story? How many of you know that story? What is that story? Exodus. Who is the story about? Moses. But who's the guy that made the golden calf? Aaron. No. It's not. When the people of Israel learned of Jeroboam's return from Egypt... This is a hundred, few hundred years later. So I, just, I just want to point something out, just to make you go, hmm. Jeroboam, they called an assembly and made him king over Israel. What has happened is Solomon has died. And Solomon's son, Rehoboam, no relation to Jeroboam. I don't even know why everybody has to have Boam on the end of their names. But Rehoboam decides, I'm going to increase your taxation, which has been horrible already. He didn't listen to his older advisors. He said, Whatever my father Solomon taxed you, I'm going to make it more. And so the people said, screw you. And they gave you the middle finger. And 10 of the northern tribes, this is why we talk about the northern tribes and the southern tribes, because Israel at that time separated. And a dude named Jeroboam became the king of the 10 northern tribes, which we won't try to name right now, but it would be really fun to see if you knew. But the, bottom, the southern tribes stayed with Rehoboam. But that's where, when the Old Testament usually talks about Israel, especially after Solomon, when they talk about Israel, they're not talking about Judah and Benjamin. They're talking about the northern tribe. And they're led by Jeroboam. He called an assembly, and they made him king over all of Israel. So only the tribe of Judah remained loyal to the family of David. Judah and Benjamin, but Benjamin, there's not many of them left, as we'll find out why. Jeroboam then built up the city of Shechem in the hill country, and it became his capital. Later, he went and built up the town of Peniel. Jer Jer Jeroboam thought to himself, unless I'm careful, the kingdom will return to the dynasty of David when these people go to Jerusalem, because they were supposed to, according to law, go to Jerusalem to where the tabernacle, and at this time, actually, it was the temple, and offer sacrifices every year. If I let the people go to Jerusalem to offer sacrifices, they will again give their allegiance to the king, Rehoboam of Judah. They'll kill me and make him king instead. So on the advice of his counselor, the king made two gold calves. He said to the people, it is too much trouble for you to worship in Jerusalem. 
Look, Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of Egypt. Just, I'm just trying to check how many of you did not know that story was in the Bible. How many of you did know the story about Aaron making the golden calf at Sinai and saying, look, it's the gods that brought you out of Egypt. How many of you knew that story? Well, that's weird. Why would you know one story and not the next story? And which story comes first? Is this simply happening again because of something Aaron did? Or is this something they have a historical record of that they're trying to write an origin of their nation for the children in Babylon who don't know who God is and have never been in Israel, that this is sort of an ongoing thing with us. We disobey, and bad things happen, and God forgives us, and he delivers us. He placed these calf idols in Bethel and Dan at either end of the kingdom. And he did a religious festival, and he told people to worship these golden calves. I just want you to think and go, hmm, why are there two golden calf stories? And why are there two guys want to have sex with these guys, but they have sex with these other girls instead, and it's okay, and that's really evil? Why are there two of each? And what does that tell us about what the Bible is? Okay? Thanks for coming. Now, we'll talk about this a little bit. Then all the Israelites, this is back to Judges. Remember, the guy's concubine was killed. He cut her up in 12 pieces, sends them to everybody, and says, hey, what are we going to do about this? Then all the Israelites, we are not as one from Dan. I'll try to read this fast. They, they assembled in the presence of the Lord at Mizpah. The leaders of all the people in the tribes of Israel, 400,000 warriors armed with swords. They took their positions in the assembly of the people of God. The Levites said, my concubine, he tells the story. He tells the story that night. People surrounded us, so I cut up her body. For these men have committed a terrible and shameful crime. Now then, all of you, the entire community must decide what has to be done about this. So all the people rose to their feet in unison and declared, none of us will go home. Not even one of us. Instead, this is what we'll do. We're going to attack Gibeah. We'll draw lots to decide who will attack it. So they were completely united. They gathered together to attack. Understand, all the other tribes of Israel are going to attack this one tribe, Benjamin, because of the horrible things. They sent messengers and said, hey, send what a terrible thing has been done. Give us those troublemakers so we can execute them. But the people of Benjamin wouldn't listen. So instead, they came from their towns and they gathered at Gibeah to fight the Israelites. The Benjamites had 26,000 soldiers. 700 elite troops, they were left-handed. If you watch The Princess Bride, I am not left-handed. But they were left-handed. And so they could sling a rock. They were really good. So Israel had 400,000, 400,000 to 26,000, okay? And so for a while, it doesn't look good. They surround them. It's not going well. But the third day, they went out. They had a strategy where they draw them out. The, the people of Benjamin came out. They were drawn away. They had killed 30 Israelites, but the ones that were in hiding when they came out of the city came up behind them. The warriors saw it. It's not going good. Sorry, I want to go through this quickly. So the main group, they were hiding in ambush. They ambushed them from the back. <coughs> 10,000 troops. So the Lord helped Israel defeat Benjamin. And that day, Israel killed 25,100 of these men. So we're down to like 900 guys. So that day, the tribe of the Benjamin... They lost 25,000, leave only 600 men. I don't know how the math works here. Men who escaped to the rock of Remen, where they lived for four months. So Benjamin is wiped out, and all the dudes go hide in the wilderness. So here's the things that have happened so far in the Bible this morning. We've had people that want to rape a guy, so instead they rape these other girls. That seems to be okay. But she dies, so now they're mad about that. He cuts her in pieces, sends her around, so they decide this is awful, and they attack their own brothers, and they kill them all. Yay, God. The Israelites returned. They slaughtered every living thing in the town. The people, the livestock, everything they found, they also burned down all the towns they came to. Now, here's the story takes an interesting turn. The Israelites had vowed at Mizpah when they got together and said, we need to attack Benjamin. We will never give our daughters in marriage to a man from the tribe of Benjamin. 
the fact that we're just talking about giving your daughter away in marriage should alert us that maybe the Bible isn't the most moral thing. How many of you guys have a daughter? Are you planning who you're going to give her to? Now, you need to get a good price for her because you're supposed to get a price. So be thinking that over while you're listening here. Now, the people went to Bethel and sat in the presence of God weeping. The people of Israel that had just wiped out all of Benjamin are remorseful. What have we done? How has this happened? Now one of, now one of our tribes is missing. We're the 12, 12 tribes of Israel. We have to completely rebrand as the 11 tribes of Israel. This is no good. What do we do? So this is the main thing that they're concerned about. <laughs> they're not concerned so much about the horrible things that have happened so far. They now begin to think, who among the tribes of Israel didn't join us at, at the, when we got together at Mizpah? Because they took a vow that everybody had to come there. And they felt sorry for their brother, Benjamin. Today, one of the tribes of Israel was cut, cut off. But the big problem is, how can we find wives now for them? For the few that remain, since we've sworn by the Lord not to give them our daughters in marriage, we can't let them be wiped out. We have to start a reproduction process to get some babies in Benjamin so we can have this tribe again. So they ask, hey, since we, is there any of the tribes, is there any location that wasn't there when we promised this? Because we've made a vow, so we can't say, oh, well, that was stupid. No, we made a vow. So everybody knows in the Bible you can't change your mind if you make a vow. So who didn't come? So they discovered that a place called Jabez Gilead, they weren't there. They didn't make the vow. So after they counted, they, they did that. So they assembled 12,000 of their best warriors with orders to kill everyone there, including women and children, this is what you're to do. Completely destroy all the males and every woman who is not a virgin. Are you taking notes on what the Bible is teaching you to do? Because that's how we use the Bible, right? We simply go there, and whatever it says, that's what we do, because the Bible clearly says. Okay? So they say, hey, we got to have wives for these people. So we're going to go kill all these guys and take their wives. Well, but not actually, you know, since they've had a wife, she's used. And so we can't have her anymore. Once you've had sex with a guy, it's just over for you. So we're going to kill everyone except the virgins. And that's how we're going to find husbands. So among the residents of Jabez Gilead, they found 400 young virgins who had never slept with a man. And they brought them to the camp of Shiloh. Congratulations. These girls were just enjoying their life yesterday. That was just 13. But here, have them have a wonderful life. We're sorry we killed your other guys. It's a bad deal. Our bad. But here's some girls to make it better. Go reproduce. Thus saith the Lord in the Bible. But there's a problem there's only 400. The, the, the soldiers that are hiding at, at Rimen, they, they said, hey, we've, we've, they returned in the four women, 400 women, but there weren't enough women for all of them. This has been the problem for all of history. There's just not enough girls. So how can we, according to the Bible, how can we, according to the Bible, after we've killed everybody we know and stolen their young daughters who haven't had sex yet, we killed their wives and their puppies. That part's okay. We got to get rid of them. They were supposed to be at the meeting and they weren't at the meeting. So kill them and take their daughters, give them. But we don't have enough daughters. This is one of my favorite stories I'm about to tell. <laughs> I just love this. So the, you know, there's not enough. So the elders of the assembly ask, how can we find wives for the few who remain since the women of the tribe of Benjamin are dead? There must be heirs for the survivors so that an entire tribe of Israel is not wiped out. What's good for the nation is put above everything else. Any morals, any ethics, any right and wrong. But we can't give them our daughters because we said we wouldn't. And if we do, God will curse us. God won't curse us for killing all these people and killing their wives and their puppies and taking their daughters. But if we give them our daughters... God will curse us because we said we wouldn't. That's what the Bible says. Then they thought, I love this, they thought of the annual festival of the Lord held in Shiloh, south of Lebanon in Phillipsburg. 
south of Lebanon and north of Bethel, along the east side of the road that goes from Bethel to Shechem. Now, you're going to find out about this festival. They told the men of Benjamin, who still needed wives, okay, here's what you do, boys. Go and hide in the vineyards. Can you see them? Can you picture this? There's guys behind a tree. Okay? That's how the girls felt, I'm sure. Go and hide in the vineyards. When you see the young women of Shiloh come out for their dances. So here is some sort of festival where the girls of this place, the young um, virgins, available women, they have dances and they go out in the woods and they dance. I see them in sort of some flowing sort of sheer type thing. There's probably somebody playing a flute. I'm not sure. But they're dancing in the forest, enjoying the carefree innocence of their teenage years at this annual festival. This is just what girls do. Are you going to be at the dance in the woods at Shiloh? Of course, I wouldn't miss it. I've been waiting for this. I'm finally 16 or whatever. I can go be in the dance. And so there's out there, but they don't know that there are men. There are men who didn't do anything about the concubines being raped. And so they've been killed by the other Israelite people, people of God, God's chosen people. And so they told him, hide behind the trees. And this is how you get a wife. If some of you single guys are wondering, how does the Bible, you know, we need to get back to biblical dating. We need to get back to biblical marriage. I agree. Hide behind a tree. And when you see a woman come dancing by, rush out from the vineyards and each of you take one of them home. Now, don't, you can't be picky because they'll, they'll scream and start running. So just grab the first one to, to the land of Benjamin to be your wife. And when their fathers and brothers come to us and protest, <laughs> we'll tell them, please be sympathetic. Let them have your daughters. Because we didn't find wives for all the people we destroyed at Jabez Gilead. And you're not guilty of breaking the vow since you didn't actually give your daughters to them. So the men of Benjamin said, that is a keen idea. Why didn't we think of that? So they did as they were told. Each man caught one of the women as she danced in the celebration and carried her off to be his wife. They returned to their own land and they rebuilt their towns. Then all the people of Israel departed by tribes and families and they returned to their own homes. The end. <laughs> in those days. The last verse of Judges, in those days, Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in his own eyes. <laughs> it is. Tell that to your children tonight. But the question is, and that's all we're doing is raising questions to go, hmm, what is this book? So it's the same one that says, I know the plans I have for you, saith God, that we're inspired by. The same one that he split the Red Sea and they went apart on dry ground. The same one has this. The same one that we use stories of something Solomon did or something that Isaiah did or something that Samuel did or David. How do we, what do we do with it? Do we simply go and find a scripture and... Is this historically true? Is this what happened? And is the story of the golden calves and Sodom and Gomorrah, is that historically true? Or is it something else that the people that are writing about it, hundreds, and concerning Sodom and Gomorrah, 1,500 to 2,000 years after the actual event, is it something that, well, that absolutely happened? Or is it being written by these ancient people in exile for another purpose? Those are my questions. And we'll talk about them more two weeks from now. Yes. <laughs> exactly. How is it everyone's fault except the man who shoved, not his wife, his concubine, out the door to be wife, to be raped? Women were considered, wives were considered property. Concubines were considered much less than property. This is what I'm saying is this book something that's teaching us morality and ethics? Is it saying, hey, this is awful, don't do that? 
What is, what is the purpose of that? Because people will say there's no contradictions in the Bible. And she brought up something. How is it everybody else's fault but his? And it just reminded me of something that's also a conflict in the Bible. When the people went into exile, if you're reading in the book of Kings, and here's where I like to point out, the Bible doesn't speak with one voice and often disagrees with itself. Often? Often is not a good word. Occasionally. 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 There was a wicked king in Judah named Manasseh. Manasseh worshipped idols and set up the high places and the sheriff poles, and we can talk about it. it seems that the big thing in the Old Testament is you can rape concubines, you can kill people and women and children. And, and see, when they told the story of they went into this town and they killed all the women and everybody but the virgins, did that happen first, or did the story of when Moses' people did that? Happen first, because there's another story where they did the exact same thing. But uh, keep the keep the virgins for yourself. It's, it's the same story. Why do we keep getting the same story? But there was a king named Manasseh. Here's Manasseh. Manasseh was really evil. This is in Second Kings. Second Kings is written a little before the exile. Before they went into exile, here's the story. And then toward the end of Second Kings is when they are going into exile. And so. Second king says, because Manasseh was so evil, that's why we went into exile. It's his fault. Okay? It's his fault. And in Second Kings, it says, Manasseh died. They buried him. But now they go into exile, 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 exile. And then, do you guys even know this is a book in the Bible? First and Second Chronicles. How many of you have ever read First and or Second Chronicles? Wow, there's a special place in heaven for you because most people don't get through it, and I don't blame them. The first nine chapters of First Chronicles is simply genealogies. And you think, I made it through Exodus. I mean, I made it through Leviticus this year. I'm in the clear. And then you run into First Chronicles. And for seven days, you're reading genealogies, and so you just give up. And then if you get through the genealogies, you're like, they're telling the same stories I just read in First and Second Kings. But they're not. They're telling some of the same stories differently. In 2 Kings, Manasseh was such an evil king that basically God caused him to die. And so he died and he was buried. But he's the reason we went into exile because he was so awful. In, second, in Chronicles, Manasseh gets taken to Babylon. And in Babylon, he repents. He's sorry. He turns back to God, and he returns to Israel. And now he's a good person that God has forgiven and restored to his land. Except that never happened. Are you calling the Bible a liar? No. I'm simply saying that did not historically happen. What historically happened is Manasseh died in Israel. He was never in Babylon. But First Chronicles says he was. I know. First Chronicles also says, you know, it wasn't Manasseh. It wasn't his evil that caused the people of Israel, Judah, to go into Babylon. It was our evil. It was because we did what was wrong. We can't blame it on Manasseh. They've been in captivity for a while. They've thought this through. And when they begin to, well, let's write down an account of who we are as a people. Let's change that part. You know, in 2 Kings, we kind of blamed Manasseh. Well, that's really not the true truth. Let's change it to where Manasseh saw how bad he was, and he repented, and he got to go back to his land. Yeah, that's what it is. So, And it was really our fault. We were bad. So maybe if we repent, God will let us go back to the land. Do you see that at all? You don't see it, but that's okay. I just want you to go, hmm, I thought the Bible was just telling me what happened. Maybe. But multiple things happen. For example, we'll talk about this next time too. Wow, I've talked for an hour and you haven't thrown things at me. We'll talk about the book of Jonah, maybe next time or the time after that. And this will make you either maybe not come back or throw stuff at me. 
You know, Jonah went to Nineveh, and Nineveh repented, and God forgave Nineveh. Nineveh is the capital of what area? Babylon. The Babylonian era. Area. And Nineveh repented, and God forgave them and didn't destroy them. They turned to God. Woo! Story of Jonah. Yeah, it never happened. It's historically incorrect. Nineveh never turned to God. Veggie tales. See, we have the Bible and veggie tales out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let every word be established. So it has to be true. It never happened. So why do we have a story about it? Come back sometime. We'll talk about it. 